Good morning, everybody. People are coming in, but I thought we'd at least uh, get a little bit started to this session, which is going to be a great session. I'm Carl Furman from the University of Pittsburgh, and I'm very, very happy to moderate this great session. Um, I think our planning for AMSA this year has been superb, and um, I think all of our sessions have been excellent so far, so I'm sure this will be no exception. Um, our first speaker is going to be Kate Klein from the University of Michigan. And I think this is a very timely topic, particularly with, uh, you know, the match of this last year. We just always assume that as, you know, in our residencies, we just get these enormous number of great applicants every year. And I think it's very, very important that we now foster some of this and recruit these. So it's, it's a great pleasure to welcome Kate, who is an expert on this uh, topic. Thank you, Dr. Furman, for inviting me to talk on a topic that I'm very passionate about. Um, as per usual, I have no disclosures. <laughs> so the objectives and what I hope the audience walks away with today is that you have the ability to identify times and potential opportunities during the medical school calendar for your interest group exposure. Also, to be able to apply creative and innovative ideas for reinvigorating your own radiology interest group and be able to examine your own radiology interest group curriculum and find areas that need improvement. So as we all know, there has been a declining interest in radiology. In 2011, only one out of 170 University of Michigan medical students matched into radiology. So the chair, Dr. Reed Dunnick, had a meeting with the educational faculty to discuss declining interest, review of the current interest group, the numbers and activities, and they decided we need to overhaul it. I was not at that meeting, so my name came up. And <laughs> Klein will do it, she'll do anything. But seriously, they knew how passionate I was about the medical students. So I had to do my research. How did I do my research and what was the best tools of researching? my feet. I walked around and I made interview, personal interviews with the recently matched students, sorry, student, um, <laughs> and to find out what other departments were doing. I talked to the current fourth years who were going into radiology. I talked to the, our residents who were from different institutions to find out what, what happened at their institutions. I talked to other interest group leaders, uh, Dr. Stravinti uh, Reddy and Dr. Magid, um, were very helpful, very forthcoming in sharing their materials and ideas with me. I also talked to um, the other interest group leaders, like the surgical groups, the family medicine groups. I also went and made appointments with the assistant deans to find out where in the curriculum are there abilities for us to have more exposure. What did I discover? I discovered several things that we were not aware of, that we could be involved with the white coat ceremony. There's an activity night for interest groups. There's a residency fair that you can advertise your residents. Um, there's an M2 elective that you can apply for. There's a formal first year shadowing experience. There was interest group boot camps. The surgical one would do a suturing. The um, orthopedic surgeons did a, had a cast boot camp. And almost all of them had dinners and social events. So I first set out and had to plan to make a group committee because I knew I could not do this alone without help. So I created a really strong team of six eager young faculty with a lot of ideas, um, included the chief residents and the senior medical students who were going to be the future presidents of the interest group. I shared all the information from my research with them and we were able to identify the different target areas we then came up with this really original name, uh, Michigan Radio Radiology Interest Group, or MRIG. We call them the MRIGs. So I sat down and I made a plan. I created a four-year curriculum. The idea behind that was I really wanted someone, if I had to leave this position tomorrow, someone could step into my shoes and have the plan already made. They wouldn't have to start from scratch or reinvent the wheel. We had to create a budget because obviously this a lot of stuff is going to take some money. Um, I presented it to the committee, and then I assigned roles to my committee members. Um, I had a shadowing coordinator, a mentorship coordinator, and then we had to take everything and that plan put it into action. 
But first of all, if we're going to go to these events, we need advertising material. So we created a beautiful banner with, um, thanks to Kate Maturin, a catchy little logo, picture yourself in radiology. Um, some poster boards to bring to the meetings. And then here's just a typical setup. We also have a poster board demonstrating the latest research material that's going on in our department. Um, and then here's another poster board. We had a table runner. Um, I can just tell you the banner cost about $600 and it's a replaceable banner that we can use other um, banners to make and it, it's collapsible and I can take it anywhere. Um, these, the runner was $100. We also had the creation of a pamphlet, something that they can take away, and we filled it up with lots of information and commonly asked questions about radiology. Also had all the contact information if they had any interest. And it was a chance, again, to answer these common questions and the common myths of radiology, like you have no patient contact. We know that that's not true. You have to be a computer genius. I, by far, am not a computer genius. You will be exposed to harmful radiation. We know that that's not true since the 1950s. Um, and you have to have a PhD in physics. <laughs> so starting with the M1 curriculum, um, there's the white coat ceremony in which you can sponsor a white coat. There's the activity night, again, where you can ha have people sign up for your interest group. The M1 shadowing experience. The radiology boot camp that I had organized a radiology interest group tailgate at my house, ultrasound boot camp, and an AMWA boot camp, the American Medical Women's Association boot camp. I also tried to target them and invite them. So first, the, what is the white coat ceremony? In the first week of medical school, the medical students have the white coat ceremony where they receive their white coat that they will have for the rest of their medical school. Um, you can sponsor it, a faculty member, a department division can sponsor it for $100, and they have a little note in their pocket, who is the white coat from, and what, from what department. The first year, I did it on my own, and it was quite rewarding, because I got this lovely thank you note from a medical student. Um, the following year, our department supported this, and we were able to provide 10 white coats from each division. So what's the activity night? The activity night is in August. It's an interest group, and it's where interest groups and clubs represent their group and try to attract new members. It's for all the M1 and M2s. This is where I, br I bring the banner, the poster, sign-up sheets, and of course you need the candy to entice them. Um, and then I have my current radiology interest group members present to promote. We have radiology residents who are eager, and if available, we bring an ultrasound machine. We can demonstrate maybe a carotid ultrasound and give the wows and oohs of ultrasound. Here's just an example. This, this year it was held outside, so we couldn't bring the ultrasound machine, but we have our previous interest group presidents, fourth year medical students. We have a resident. Um, again, here's our typical layout. We have our sign-up sheets for the interest group and sign-up sheets for the boot camps. Here's one that was indoors, and again, we were able to bring in our ultrasound for this one, and we were demonstrating just ultrasounds of the carotid artery. So what is the boot camp? Um, there's many definitions of boot camp lately, but this boot camp um, is a volunteer basis. Again, I have the sign-up sheets during the activity night. It's a series of two lectures and one tour over the noon hour on different days. I limit it to 15 because I do better with small groups. We can make it more interactive, and they're, they're less intimidated and ask a lot more questions. Once we, fit, we um, fill up the sheet of 15, we have another session sheet. So I do multiple sessions over the year. We provide a fantastic lunch. Um, again, thanks to the support of our department. Um, we provide no pizza because they are drowning in pizza by this point. And so sometimes we'll have Mexican, Indian, and um, they find that a huge treat. And I do multiple sessions over the year. I currently have done two sessions, and I'm going to be doing a session for the AMWA group in May. It starts, again, thanks to the collaboration with uh, Dr. Reddy, we've come up with a case-based introduction to radiology, and I use an uh, um, audience response system to keep everything interactive, and I go over a case where a patient actually presents with Horner syndrome. What's really nice about this is that 
This is the first time they learn about Horner syndrome, which is a common syndrome they're going to hear about throughout their entire medical career. And every time they hear about it, they're going to be thinking, oh, I remember the radiologist taught me that. We also do introduction to interventional radiology. And then the third lunch um, is followed by a tour of the department. And we purposely do it over lunch because it's at least during working hours. We've previously done it after hours, but everybody is mainly everybody is gone, where a lot of people are working over the noon hour and there's a lot of activity going on and they can see that activity. I also throw in lots of pictures of me with patients to demonstrate, um, the, to try to debunk the myth that we don't have enough patient contact. So the tailgate party, um, this is a lot of fun. It's uh, Friday, I pick a Friday night before the Michigan game in the fall. Um, invite all the medical students that have signed up and usually during the first year I get about 35 to 40 first year medical students um, sign up for the party. And then we invite a bunch of residents and faculty for the meet and greet and I keep it really casual. Um, the reason I do it the Friday night before a Michigan game, anybody here been to a Michigan game? So you know what happens at the Michigan games. Um, it's less intimidating for them because if we had one the day of the Michigan game, um, they probably wouldn't come. <laughs> so again, they, um, I have it at my house. They come in, we have name tags all ready for them. Um, I put out my stuff. Again, here's my banner with a really happy couple of first years. Um, I have to convince my husband not to talk about ophthalmology. And he's pretty good about it. And then they get to meet our mascot, my dog Spike. So during the M2 years, what's, what goes on there? Um, again, they are involved in the activity night. I do an ultrasound boot camp. And then we also have the M2 electives. It, this is involved with a course called Patients and Populations, in which all specialties can apply to have a six-hour elective with the med students. We then came up with seven electives, and it's for 10 to 12 students each. And these have been full for the last three years, with the coordinator often calling me and asking me if they, we would take another student or two. So the ultrasound boot camp, very similar to the other um, boot camp, um, but the other di the big difference is that um, after many years of begging and borrowing, um, I was able to obtain two dedicated ultrasound machines for teaching, which is just, it's key. I don't have to use, uh, patients, um, use up patient time or clinical time. I limit this to eight people. Again, if it fills up, we just make a new list and I just do another session. I offer multiple sessions throughout the year, and we do it only we do it over two lunch periods, and we provide food. Um, while they're eating lunch, I do an introduction to ultrasound, and then we break up the group into two groups of four, and then we we scan um, we scan I don't I don't let them scan me, but um, they scan each other, and we go over the very straightforward abdominal. Um, abdominal organs, and then the next week we do MSK and we'll look at the shoulder and look at the tendons of the shoulder. M3 year, it's a little bit more difficult in the M3 year because as you know, they're in their clerkship. They do have a career night in January in which after um, a lecture, they do a breakout session to different areas. They'll come to the radiology area and that's when I find out who's seriously considering radiology. I match them up with an advisor and then we give them a how to apply to radiology um, lecture over lunch. There's a common theme here. Um, and we, have, we invite the newly matched M4s so that there's a Q&A panel. We then decide who the new president and co-president of MRIG is going to be. And usually how I do that is basically I look at who's shown interest the longest. And often it's somebody who's shown interest since the first year or second year. So our M4s, now that we know that they're interested in radiology, I get them involved with everything that you've just seen in the previous three years. And this just helps their application and their um, ability during the interview, something to talk about. In September, I do a mock interview. And during this mock interview, um, it's 
I, con I consider this very serious. Um, I have volunteer faculty and chief residents who've previously served on residency admissions committees so that they're very familiar with the interview process. I get a copy of the applications from the students and I send them to the interviewers prior to the day. I schedule a formal itinerary with three 30-minute interview blocks. I tell them, dress in your best interview clothes. And then after, we have a debriefing as an entire group, um, of course, over lunch. Um, and then we just you know, ask, debrief, say, how did it go? What did you think? But then they leave, we dismiss them, and then we have a really serious conversation about their application and their um, interview skills. I then schedule a one-hour appointment with each medical student, and I am brutally honest with them, and I, I warn them ahead of time um, before they participate, I'm going to be brutally honest, and I don't mean to hurt your feelings, but I want to help you, and they can decide whether or not they can proceed, and they all do. Um, but we, we go over the strength of the application, should they redo their statement, um, are, should they get better or more letters? Or things that should be addressed in the interview, obvious pink flags that they should probably bring up in the interview and switch it to a positive. Um, their interview skills, communication, expressivity. So some of the issues that have come up, um, we had one fellow who was just, every time I asked a question, he just was really quite negative. Sat down during that hour, we had a long talk, and said, look, you've got to make things positive, and he ended up being one of the best interviewers out of that group. Um, awkward communication problems, bad habits. Had one applicant who kept adjusting her glasses every 30 seconds, and I just told her, I said, I think you need to get your glasses tightened. <laughs> and then we had one poor fella who just had really bad, bad hair, and I just said, and you just need to get a better professional haircut, and he did. So results, so you're like, okay, she's gone through all this work, well, where's the data? Is this working or not? And I'm just laying it all out, being transparent. Um, 2001, this is the one fellow. Um, that's when I was asked to lead the group. Uh, 2012, we had three. I don't honestly take credit for that since ever, they already were interested in radiology. Next year, three. So remember, radiology interest is declining at this point, and I'm holding steady at three. I thought, OK, this is not too bad. Um, and then even 2015, there's an increase where nationally there's a decrease. So I'm going to plug this as a win. <laughs> Thanks. Um, this year we have about six. So I'm just overall getting to be positive about this. Um, in 2012, 35 sign up. The next, some drop off as 15. Then ultimately there was four. So if I can reach out to 35 to 40 out of 170 M1s every year, that just, that, that just increases our exposure and our image, and I'm okay with that, and I take that as a win. Um, personal results. I've been asked to be on the curriculum committee involvement because of all my interaction with the medical students. We're, um, University of Michigan's going through a big overhaul um, of their curriculum, and I've been at the table. Um, I'm right now working with the medical school on a 10% effort. And they've asked me to be the lead for a future diagnostic and therapeutic branch, which is going to be a, very similar to a clerkship director. And I've made these great connections with students as M1s. Even if they don't go into radiology, I have complete job satisfaction, because I love doing this. Finally, take home points. Finding opportunities for more exposure is possible. They're there, we just have to find them. Don't be afraid to create your own opportunities. Like I said, fine, I'm gonna have something at noon. And follow through on your creative ideas. After Dr. Whitehair's lecture, I've got tons more ideas now that I'm going to start to implement. And even if the students choose other specialties, we are creating positive connections, which is so important. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Kate. Um, this is a big room. It's kind of intimidating to have such a big room, but all of our speakers are going to be available, and we will have a question period afterwards. So sort of keeping on schedule here. Our, our next speaker is going to be um, Alex Greco from Ohio State, and um, his topic will be sharing the healer's art as a physician teacher, tutor, tu um, tutor and student coach. 
starts. Thank you, Carl, very much. Thank you to Kate, and thank you all for being with us this morning and joining us to hear about some different ways that we can activate and work with our students. Financial disclosure to start, I have no finances, um, you know, no relevant finances at least, a good way to begin, um, but I do have some objectives for us to think about. I want you to be able to list the ways that radiologists can engage students beyond the radiology interest group to discuss the role of the student advocate from the curricular and extracurricular perspectives, and to develop your own definition of the radiologist as medical teacher. Now, I was having a conversation uh, with a student just in the last week, thinking about this meeting and coming along. He's an avid enthusiast of J.R.R. Tolkien. Uh, we won't take a show of hands in the room. Um, let's see who uh, fits with that. But he said, you know, Dr. Grigo, I don't know how you can do that every day. You know, I don't know how you can sit in that dark room. It's like working in Gollum's cave for a, a livelihood. And I said, no, 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 Jacob, absolutely not. Look at uh, Gollum's cave is much better lit. It has much better ambient lighting. And we turn in our precious once a month per the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So, you know, having Jacob's attention, we can go forward. So a question we can ask. We certainly heard uh, Kate's tremendous work with the radiologist uh, interest group at Michigan. So we can ask ourselves now, how do we, academic radiologists, engage students beyond the walls of the reading room, the gross course, uh, and the radiology interest group? Well, I'll say that by being at this meeting, by committing your time and energy and presence here, we're all learner-centered, and that's the place to begin answering this question of what does the medical teacher do. Now if we look at this, we've all had to consider at one time or another what we are. And you know, that is challenging to define because we're constantly evolving in terms of place, our phase in career, the context, and very much the audience that we're addressing, whether that's students, colleagues, or our colleagues across the proverbial street at the medical school. Now what we do, that's an easier definition for a lot of us to say and to list things out and quite evidently it can be a longer list. And so say we are here walking down Canal Street or someplace close by, we as educators, as learner-centered teachers have many different hats that we wear. Many people can identify, I'm sure, with some of the roles listed here, certainly career advising, an administrator in our department's clerkship teacher, clerkship director, mentor, and rig advisor. And certainly in this day and age, that whole wall of hats on the left could be our clinical responsibilities on a given day. I would say let's add an additional hat with our locale in mind that we can think about here. A bit unconventional perhaps, but one of the faculty tutor. Now back at Ohio State, this is a, a statement I heard more than once uh, from across the street at the medical school, radiology. Hmm, that's different in terms of thinking about some additional roles that I'll, I'll show you today and, and terms to talk about and that has certainly evolved from that point into something that's been tremendously beneficial. And this is our staff from our Office of Medical Education. I've had the pleasure of working with so many of them one-on-one -on -one with our students. Now, if we commission uh, one of those shuttle buses from the Mardi Gras Museum and all come up and visit Ohio State, this is Miling Hall that we would see and come up the stairs. And when you do that, this office right to the right is our Office of Student Life. There's a variety of services offered there, one of which is academic tutoring. Call it the academic support team at Ohio State that's composed of faculty, counselors, and trained psychologists that work with our students who are encountering a variety of difficulties along the spectrum. That is facilitated and funded by the Office of Student Life and shared by our Associate Dean of Student Life, Dr. Joy Lynn. Now, that we're referral-based. It's for high-risk students that have found difficulty at different stages, uh, at risk for program failure, some issues with the STEP exam, etc., and needing some assistance. We're looking at our core educational objectives as a way to, to map this out. And, you know, I'll say that the majority of the faculty tutors on that team do focus on the clinical side of things, on the clinical sciences. That leaves the foundational sciences and an area where we can have an especially positive role. Now, tutoring in the foundational sciences, it's a challenge, meaning for us learner-centered educators, an opportunity, that's almost word for word how uh, Dr. Lin described it to me as we were discussing the possibility of me taking this role, taking this on. 
And I'll say that tutoring in the foundational work, it's, it's a reunion with old friends. Now, we heard yesterday, for a lot of us, the uh, work with gross anatomy and that role with students, that fits very much with what we do on a daily basis, and that, that fits right in line. Now, this is, all, and additionally, a chance to reunite with old frenemies. Jerry Maguire, you had me at coenzyme A. Uh, you know, this is a way in certainly working with our students through the foundations. Yes, the indirect and direct pathways of the basal ganglia, uh, certain uh, a fun afternoon to go back through and work with students on this topic. And our present project uh, has some phone calls and emails even during this meeting have been working with uh, several different students to help them through what for many can be a pivotal step all of these discussions of careers that we're talking about. So what does this do? Tutoring in the foundational sciences. Well, it's a revisitation and really a renewal of perspective and context. And what that was, I looked out and saw the faces you know, that people had with that Krebs cycle and things going up. What that does and what you know, Dr. Schaefer has pointed out at a few different elements, when we have to actually take a concept and relearn it, look back at it, realize that we might have been challenged what we can bring to students is a different perspective. We have in our mind what is clinically relevant, what we do use on a daily basis, and ways to help them by creating links to future practice, both the roots and the roots, other spelling of common diagnoses that may be helpful to them, and really a rationale behind their interventions with principles of diagnostic imaging, a common thread and a common root for with which we can approach that. We heard from Dr. Matt Hartman yesterday, RAD path correlation and the AU RAD physio correlation. Putting these together can create a visual representation. For many students, yes, that is a good question. Why would anyone need to talk about the glucose transporter and the glucose metabolism? Yes, that is a good question. When clinically, for many patients that you'll care for, can we give this a visual representation? And I'll tell you that across the range of learning styles, with very few exceptions, putting an illustrative example has been very helpful. So looking at that role on the academic support team, engagement of the student learner, connection with the content, offering that to them, looking at a very realistic, real-world view of relevance for them, support in many cases before, long before the career advising works, and a way to be a presence in their academic life from the radiological standpoint by visual representation. So let's revise our question a little. How do we, academic radiologists, add value to the education process for our students? And we know that the challenge of medical education is really a balance beam between our ever burgeoning clinical responsibilities, teaching between students, residents, and fellows, and the administrative roles that we take there. Now, a high value element of medical education, I'm sure, is a part of our home curriculum looking at direct observation of competence, DOCs. So what we can do with that as our, as our students mature clinically is to think, how do we contribute directly and indirectly to the development of competence? What Ohio State, we have the Lead, Serve, Inspire medical curriculum that began in 2012, not long after my beginning at uh, Ohio State. It's a four-year, three-part curriculum built on multivariate longitudinal integration. And what we've done is to take the foundational and the clinical sciences together, distribute that content throughout the four years with an emphasis on self-directed learning. Speaking of visual representations, uh, here is our uh, curriculum going left to right. At the core of this progression for our students is a longitudinal student-coach relationship that's anchored in an all-inclusive learning portfolio. Faculty, coaches, and students meet at regular intervals throughout the curriculum. Review of progress, educational, and quite honestly, life progress is a big part of that. And that's through a discussion of series of uh, guided reflections. And my group, my coaching group of eight students from that first class is from the graduating class of 2016 who are now beginning to think about the process of ERAS. 
We've mentioned this is longitudinal. How longitudinal exactly? Well, we met each other on the first day of medical school in those rows of the large auditorium, and we'll be together on graduation day with chances for hooding and accompanying them at the end of their journey. Now, it's not just the beginning and end, the bookends. We have uh, accompanying them to their first day in anatomy up at the uh, table with them for that first set of rounds. And also, we will contribute directly from a synopsis of those reflections to their MSPE, which is also under development currently. So looking at this, coaching is a faculty role. How does that work? Well, what does it involve? It's well established in the athletic and business circles, but it's gaining recognition at multiple levels of education. One might ask, how is that different than mentoring? I would say certainly it's not a replacement for, and there's certainly commonalities with mentoring. And uh, transcribing from Dr. Ng's letter that I received a few years ago, you have been aside to meet uh, with Dr. Donna Magid, and I would say that much of the reason that I'm up here with you today is through this mentoring process that we've all uh, encountered at different times. So looking at coaching, what that focuses on, quite honestly, is a similar idea, but in practice, the interactions focusing on personal goal setting. Self-assessment being at the center with a self-directed learning trajectory guided by reflection and feedback. And so really we can represent it here with some focused interactions along the course of their academic development with the ultimate goal being expertise acquired through deliberate practice. Now, there's additional responsibilities that come along with us when we take these roles at the medical center. They, they multiply, as we see, between assessment, evaluation, clinical performance, the OSCEs that we can become involved with, and step two preparation. And as a result of my work with the coaching students and a, uh, an invitation slash strong recommendation, please come interview to be a longitudinal preceptor, uh, one of the first uh, from our department, to work with the students in an additional longitudinal manner. So looking back here, we certainly have a way of bringing to light a lot of the goals that have been expressed at this conference. Now, we have a core philosophy, and that is professional identity formation. It's a little bit of a new term to some. It's uh, certainly a lot in the increasing uh, vocabulary that we use in educational literature. It's recognized as a critical element of medical education, distinct from profession and from professionalism. This is the Cook and Irby report that Dr. Whitehair referred to yesterday, and when we're called to reimagine our way that we interact with students and fashion their educational experience. It's really one's concept of himself or herself as a physician that can change over time. And we can certainly see that those hats, the different roles that we take, can certainly extend beyond the student years. Final revision of our question, how do we, academic radiologists, contribute meaningfully to the professional identity formation of our students who are, in fact, our future radiology colleagues and our future referring clinicians? Well, we can look at the roles we've looked at so far once again, meaning the challenged learner, and we can be an academic tutor for him or her. The evolving, exploring, defining learner can be a coach and a longitudinal preceptor as part of our program committee. These are really categories in many of the things that we do that fit in these curricular and extracurricular elements that we all take can have a profound impact on students with the role of advocacy at the very center. And still we're really left here, right? We have the learner on one side, the educator on the other side, and we still call upon students in that professional identity formation to come to the center. And the question is, how do we bridge that gap? How do we help them to develop that identity before all of those skills are set in stone, radiology or otherwise? Well, to use the words of the visionary educator that suggested a way to do this, we want to connect the learner and teacher in a medium that trans the divisiveness of expertise. And here we are with the healer's art. Founded by Rachel Remen, out at, uh, we have some colleagues here from the University of California, San Francisco. This is founded by Dr. Remen in 1991, now an international institution. It's an elective for early stage medical students focusing on the humanistic side of medicine through the discovery model. Here we are with the uh, Ohio State chapter among the, the increasing numbers of places enrolled here. Brought to Ohio State in 2008 by Dr. Cynthia Krieger from our Department of Internal Medicine. 
I've been a facilitator for the course since 2013, connecting with a group of first year students who take this pledge, this challenge of being a part of that. And I tell the students very regularly that I've been enrolled since 2013 because being there, learning from them, it's a way to gain and work with them. I've been a co-director of the course with Dr. Krieger upon her invitation in, since 2014. And it's something that's profoundly changed the way that I can work with students. And you ask yourself in any of our curricula, when you can ask and have to ask, who is the teacher? Who is the learner in this setting? And for that to not only be the norm, but the expectation, that can be one of the most major victories. Because first and foremost, we're people helping people and only then are we doctors helping patients. And however we view and describe this structure through our respective levels of medical education, then we can see. Beyond the reading room, a summary for you to conclude. Learner-centeredness as our central tenant, we can do that academic tutoring. We can add value to the educational process by seeing a student coach and longitudinal preceptor. And we can most importantly support their professional identity by becoming a part of healer's art. Radiology, hmm, that's different. And with the willingness, the energy, and the commitment of students, and a match that I've had the pleasure of having since I began at Ohio State, I can say yes, it is different, and we can all make that difference for our students. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Alec. That was really very inspiring. Um, and we will have questions at the end for people. So, uh, Next a speaker is from John Hopkins. He's going to be talking to us on mentoring medical students, research projects, and manuscripts. I think this is a very, very important topic for all of us because uh, many medical students do want to be involved in research. And it's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Subramanian here, too talk to us on that. Thank you. Um, thank you, Carl. Uh, thank you for the invitation to talk about med students research. Um, this is my personal journey, so most of what I'm going to talk about is my ideas that I developed over the last seven to eight years. Um, I mentored closer to 40 med students who entered radiology residency program uh, more than 15 um, academic universities in the U.S. and in Australia and New Zealand. So uh, this is a synops synopsis from that experience. The importance of attracting med students is very simple. We want to attract the talented students. We want to teach them how to do research. And I can assure you, they do more research than me now as they have spread their wings and it impacts the world of where radiology is practiced. I always begin this in my mind. I wanted to teach them a small defined project that eventually led, led to a publication. That's my goal when I start with them because I want to take them from the idea to publication before they leave from my you know, mentoring. Um, I ensure they have a very good learning experience um, and I seed the mind so that they will prosper whatever they decide to do in radiology. And of all the 40 year students who entered radiology residency, I have to also acknowledge I have probably less than five students entered other residency programs who I mentored. So this is not a one-way street. There are some benefits educating other subspecialty students. Why do we attract med students and undergrads? They're highly motivated. There's no question about it. Extremely motivated because they want to enter radiology or if they are undergrads, they want to enter med school. They are achievement oriented. They bring a different, each of them brings a different skill sets that I don't have sometimes, my residents don't have, and my postdocs don't have. And that adds diversity to our group. 
They are persistent, most of them are. And it's all about this work. It's all about signal, not the noise. I really enjoy that part. It's all about the signal, not the noise. How do you recruit students? I think the best way I have found it, once they start to hear about you, they will come to you. You don't need to do any advertisement. You don't need to publish your projects that you are doing. And even yesterday morning, I got three emails from three medical students from three different schools in the U.S. wanting to come and work. That's because my previous students talk about the experience they had. So it's word of mouth is the best approach. However, having said that, I have listed my projects um, at the Hopkins and before that at BU um, in the institutional programs so that when I first got there, at least the students need to know about. But once that train starts, it never stops. I can promise that. Um, the interactions with radiology interest group, um, that's an important piece because that's where they know about you as a mentor. From a research idea to manuscripts, it goes through a circle and we need to prepare them and this is what it is. I'm going to go through this very simply and take you how I prepared the students and uh, with, you know, with very humbleness, I would say more than 75 percentage of my academic manuscripts published has a medical student as the first or the second author. So that came through this, going through this cycle repeatedly and multiple times. Um, the, I gauge their skill or competency because some of the med students have sometimes come with extensive research skill. So I, I, I gauge that in my first interaction. Um, so the idea that you're going to give it to them can be very simple for, as, an, as an introduction to research or it could be a very complex project because some of them would have had extensive research training. Um, however, majority of them, I start with a small project or a, a small component of an ongoing large project. But my in game is always they will walk away with their first or second or the paper by the time they finish with me. So that's the goal. This is the most daunting task for a student who you know, has not and done this to getting the IRB for a project. So I do the heavy lifting. Almost every project I did the IRB. Um, so that sort of makes their transition easier. I involve them in the process but I do the heavy lifting for this. Um, there are some research you could do without IRB, such as you know, systematic reviews and meta-analysis. There are some students really clued into it, and it's doable if they are interested in. Um, the data collection, the key is to establish the data elements sitting with the students and, you know, uh, and going through that in my early days, I used to involve a statistician because I was learning as well. But nowadays, I don't involve a statistician because most of the statistical analysis I could do myself. Um, but at the beginning, I involved a statistician when we first started a project. Um, and I set clear timeline. I meet with the students regularly and give them feedback. And I also tie the students to a team of postdocs fellows and residents and fellows so that they are part of a fabric rather than they are just an isolated people. Uh, they are part of my team, they are part of my lab, they are part of our you know, future. That's how I see them. A data analysis, again, as I said, initially as I, you know, when I started my career, I used to 
have a statistician permanently help us. Um, we used to explain the analysis to the students so that they get an idea how to do this analysis or at least have a broad view. Um, and also, I learned something. It was a striking. My first student, summer research student, came to me with extensive statistical expertise. And I felt almost dumb in front of the student because I didn't have that skills. Then onwards, I did an in a advanced MPH, also oh, MPH with an advanced statistical program and learn how to do statistics. That really helped me. The manuscript, it, this, is a, this is an art, this is a cycle, this is an iterations. Um, I write with them, uh, I write the wave. I normally do multiple iterations, multiple edits, uh, because this is the end game. They need to see this tangible benefit at the end of the time they spend with us, rather than saying, yeah, I went to this lab and I had a good time. No, I really want them to say, I went to this lab, I learned something, and I published a paper. That's what I want them to get out. There are multiple funding I had. Actually, I had numerous funding to support my students. Um, most of them are happy to volunteer, but um, now at Hopkins, I organize a, a designed program as an undergraduate course for this. Um, I had multiple summer research scholarship students, um, undergrad undergraduate you know, research awards. Um, there's an R25 program students. Uh, and then there are sometimes you will have an year long med students in a, uh, there are programs. So there are multiple ways to fund it, but most of them come to you as a volunteer to, to enhance their career. So what are the issues? You know, it, it's easy to say the successes, but this is where the road meets the rubber. Some students disappear. Yep, that is, in, in, in research, you've got to ac accept that factor. Um, I have to say, of all the students I mentored, maybe at a couple of students disappeared, but that will happen to you. There's no question about it. Um, the intensity and progress of a project is individual. Um, I give them plenty of time as long as they are doing, they're willing to do the hard work because their aptitude to research sort of varies and you, you go with that right, so that's the key part. Um, then the, you know, there's a commitment from the student and the faculty and I could clearly see in myself um, when I had students as my, you know, really group, I spent a lot of time with them now I have postdocs, I have residents, I have fellows. So my time dedicated to individually mentor them sort of shrinks because of the so many people we mentor. Um, so we need to keep that reminding, yes, this is our bread and butter. This is, these are the people going to be in our speciality. So you spend time with them and I like your time. Um, since students come from all over the country, they don't finish their project on time, so they would go leave your lab. Um, so you have to manage a distance, that's a tough task. But if the student and you are motivated, it's doable. Um, I also take the responsibility of submitting the manuscript because it's a difficult task when someone has left you to keep tracking all the manuscript submissions. So I take the responsibility and do it myself. Um, then comes also a team approach, you know, like sometimes a student works with a postdoc or a resident or, a, a, or another fellow, so you prioritize and make sure the student gets enough credit to the level of work that they do so that they are given you know, a good position in the authorship of the papers. The finally I learned students and sure everyone has a finite capacity in life. So I normally suss it out what's the ass assignments, what the exams they have outside my lab in their course um, so that I tailor make the project and the deadlines so that it doesn't clash with their other priorities because 
everyone has a finite capacity and we need to sort of roll with that space. So rewards. I think mentoring young people is the true happiness. Uh, I will give you a story. Yesterday or day before yesterday, I was moderating the ACR AUR scholar program here. And one of the recipients, without my knowledge, walked up to me and said, hi, Dr. Subramaniam. And I looked at, yes, she was the best students I ever had. She, was, she did a summer scholarship with me as a first year medical student. He published eight papers, including radiology, general nuclear medicine, and AJI as first author. She published four book chapters before she finished medical school. And then she came to me and said, I'm here as secondary radiology resident. I won this award, and I'm going to give my presentation today. So you could see how happy I was on that moment. Uh, it was a thrilling moment. Um, second one is I worked on PET-CT and nuclear medicine and in a, in a head and neck. And now she's working on interventional radiology, and she has her own portfolio. So you would have an impact on the field if you mentor enough young people, because they will take their different directions. Um, it's a very, working with people who are extremely grateful. I said 99% of the med students you work with, they are extremely grateful you work with them, you put them as the first or second order on a paper, and they got a paper out of working with you. They're extremely grateful for the rest of your life, and, and, and you mentor them and give them a boost start. So that's a real reward. So in closing, I want to say, give clear responsibility. Closely supervise them. That's the feedback. And give a timely feedback. Involve with their whole process. And give some autonomy so that they would develop and build their careers eventually. Finally, I want to close this with this remark. I asked myself, who are my mentors? I had my training in New Zealand radiology training, my fellowship training in, in, at Mayo, and, and faculty position in US in different institutions. And one thread all of these people did is they put my interest above their interest. They selflessly advanced my career. They were truly well went beyond what was the just, you know, from a resident, from a fellow, from a faculty, you know, faculty working for a different chief and a, and a chair. They went beyond that broader, and I try to do that with my every medical student. Go beyond just a medical student. And this has been a wonderful journey. Thank you. Thank you for an excellent uh, talk. That was a very inspiring. Um, our last speaker of our session is going to be Dr. Um, Maxfield from uh, Duke University. and. Um, when I saw the title of this, oops, I thought this has to be a very, very interesting topic, including medical students and international medical education experiences. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Maxfield to our podium. Thanks, Carl. And this is. Um, uh, as, as you will become quickly evident, not so much a talk about my allowing medical students to be involved in global health projects, but actually a story of a project that would not have got off the ground without the unique skill set presented by a couple of our medical students. I regret that I have but one disclosure. Um, Rad Aid has been uh, very generous in their, in their financial support of my travels um, for this uh, project to, to thrive going forward. I hope to fill up this slide a little bit more. Uh, but let me start with a story of this, uh, of this project quickly. So back in 2011, I was invited to, um, to speak in China. It was at the, the CCR, the Chinese uh, uh, 
Congress of Radiology, and I spoke on a, on a clinical topic. But I got to spend several days there and, and met a lot of Chinese radiologists. And uh, the best part of the trip for me was talking to all the radiologists there about what they do and what their practice is like. And being a program director, which I am now, I was most interested in, in, their, in their training. And some of the observations that I came away from that visit with, first of all, I was really impressed with the, the hardware in China, at least in the, in the eastern part of the country. It's incredibly impressive. The hospitals there have you know, CT scanners and MR scanners that rival any of ours. Um, the radiologists, too, uh, brilliant, um, innovative, resourceful, very impressed. But their training, not so much. Um, uh, it seems like almost everybody who I asked about their training had a different story to tell. Typically, they were just hired out of medical school by a hospital, and they kind of apprenticed basically for a few years. And I found really there was no structure and no standardization. And it kind of struck me that this was, you know, at a time where their country is suddenly, you know, has great resources to image and is just starting to realize the great potential of diagnostic imaging to improve public health. I'm not sure that their training as is is ready to take advantage of that and, and get their radiologists ready uh, for that challenge. So I came up with kind of a plan. Actually, maybe I should have dream up here instead of plan, but um, I thought, gee, the country really needs to improve their, their residency training, and uh, they need to do it through standardization and, 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 and through cert certification. And that's going to happen, I'm convinced. Over the next 20 years, China is going to do this. Um, but maybe somebody needs to, to kickstart it, and I was naive to th enough to think, well, why not me? So I thought, gee, maybe I can, I can see what I can do here. So the first thing I did when I came back to the U.S. was to, in kind of an effort to reach out to the Chinese, was to write uh, an article about our training here. Um, it was translated into Chinese and published in the Chinese Journal of, of Radiology. Then I thought more about, um, about a plan. And while I was there at that meeting, I was lucky enough to meet the president-elect of the Chinese Society of Radiology. And I thought, boy, this is very, you know, great opportunity, if not fate, um, to have met this guy. And maybe this is the way I can go. So my plan was to engage the Chinese society in a comprehensive evaluation of, of their training now and then perhaps with them to study formulation of national standards for, for training and circulation. Also perhaps to work with and through them to interpret new CMDA guidelines that had come out in China. The CMDA is the Chinese Medical Doctors Association. Basically, it's the government there that, and that kind of regulates the practice of medicine. And they had come up with guidelines in 2007 for residency training, which were new, but I found that everybody, few people were aware of them, and, and they were largely uh, ignored. Um, so I got kind of excited about this, but obviously there were, there were pretty big barriers to, to, to doing something here, right? Um, starting with language and, and, the, and the culture, which is equally important. Also trust. I didn't realize what an issue that would be. And I'm not just talking about them trusting me, an American, going over there and trying to, to stimulate some work, but just um, of each other. Um, Interesting, one of the reasons that my effort to, to partner with the CSR fell through was I, I, I came to learn that the, the president-elect of the CSR was from Shanghai and that the radiologists in Beijing therefore may not trust that person very much. I didn't give up, um, and I kind of thought about, gee, what, what my needs might be to make such, get such a project going. And obviously the first thing was language, right, not just communication, but there are, lock, there are documents to translate English to Chinese, Chinese to English. Um, I would need someone or some way to understand the culture better and, and, um, and not mess up my interactions there. And just the day-to-day -day planning of uh, not only the project itself, but travel and, and coordination with visits to different hospitals. And it seemed almost insurmountable until Caroline Carrico uh, introduced me to a couple of Duke medical students. Um, that were a godsend. This is Mong Fei and Elaine, and uh, both had grown up in China and came to the U.S. during their high school years, uh, went to uh, and were at, uh, are at medical school, medical school um, at Duke. Elaine actually, um, in addition to her medical experience, between college and med school actually um, had worked as a management consultant in the finance industry and in the pharmaceutical industry, so she brought a lot of those skills um, too. 
So this is what they brought to, uh, to our team. First of all, they're both fluent in Mandarin, which was necessary. They understood Chinese culture. Obviously, um, Elaine's uh, experience in management consultant, more valuable than I, than I knew. In fact, I didn't realize going in that I needed all these skills that she brought. I was just thinking of the language benefit, but project planning and communication, presentation, negotiation, um, all necessary. They both had uh, rich research experience coming in, which helped. They were very resourceful, which we needed. I mean, the first thing we had to do was try to understand what they do now in China as far as medical education. And, and there's no body of literature out there that explains it. So a lot of what we found out was through their connections, their friends. They would get on government websites and whatever they could find to kind of put this together. And lastly, they were really motivated. Um, they both you know, wanted to help their home country. Um, they're both interested in, in global health. So the first thing that we had to do was they had to help me or really all of us understand what does China do now for medical education from you know, secondary school all the way up through their subspecialty training. And so Elaine and Mong Fei went through all the available documents they could, they could find and talked to old friends back in China. And after about a month, put together this amazing uh, package and presentation for me really explaining all of it. And you can see it's really quite complex. Um, the, the, the language translation was only the first step in understanding it um, because it's so complex, but there were three-year, five-year, seven-year programs. Some of the more elite schools in China now have eight-year programs. Um, but with their help, we figured it out and then went on to actually publish it. It's the first, um, uh, first paper in the literature, English or Chinese, on radiology education in China. And as you can see, Elaine was first author on that paper. So uh, together, um, and certainly again with their, with their skills and experience and knowledge, we put together a plan that instead of trying to do this uh, uh, nationally through the CSR or the national organization, that we start in Beijing. Turns out there are 16 residency programs in the city, and I call them residency programs. They're, you know, most of them are small hospitals with one, with one you know, uh, apprentice in there. Um, Amazing variation in the resources between the program, starting with People's Hospital at the top, which is kind of their mecca there. It's kind of their, um, their uh, you know, their, their, I think the most, uh, the hospital of the highest reputation in the country. And to get all those um, hospital and programs together, we thought we'd start with a comprehensive assessment of all of them to see what kind of resources they had and what they did, and then we'd share those results um, and maybe share some of the resources going forward. So in October of that year, uh, Elaine and I went uh, to China, to Changchow, for the CSR meeting. And there we met with the program directors of, uh, I call them program directors, we could say representatives from four of the, uh, the hospitals in Beijing in order to establish a collaboration, um, reach an agreement on, on working together with program objectives perform some kind of initial uh, assessment to inform the preparation for the rollout, um, uh, try to anticipate difficulties that we would have and start talking about funding from, from both sides. And it's, we spent a lot of time just talking about training in our country and things on this list that everybody in this room takes for granted here, right? But in, these were kind of foreign um, to, the, to the people that we met with, the structured clinical curriculum and and lecture series and evaluations and supervision, uh, et cetera. So this talk is not about my project. It's about, um, it's about the medical students. But let me just real briefly kind of tell you what um, the first step of this project was, was again to, was to assess these 16 programs. Um, and it was fairly time consuming. So we'd have the, uh, the plan was to visit each of these hospitals and spend a couple of days assessing, first of all, their hospital and program infrastructure and then to see what they did, if anything, for teaching and whether they had a, a, a curriculum. And then finally, what they did, if anything, in is, is terms of evaluation and, and certification. Step two, once the assessment was done, was to share all those results with the 16 programs and extract best practices and consider what could be shared um, and then maybe discuss some kind of standardization within the city. And if that was successful, to then try to go from Beijing outward and, and um, to expand throughout China. So based on the discussions that, uh, at that meeting, we identified six beta sites that we would visit and, and, and start with. 
And the following year, several months later, the three of us, Elaine, Mong Fei, and I, jumped on another plane and went back to China again. And we visited People's Hospital and Beijing Children's Hospital um, and, and one other and spent about two days at each hospital, again, assessing um, uh, the hospital, the program, uh, and the residents. One thing that they all allowed us to do was actually, to, in assessing their residents, was to test them. So we actually came up with a, with a test and gave it to the residents at each program and discovered quite a discrepancy in the, in the, in the, um, in what, in the knowledge base of the residents at the different programs. Here's Mong Fei, here's uh, Elaine here and Mong Fei both proctoring the, the exam. Um, I wrote the questions on the test and Elaine and Mong Fei helped me translate them into Chinese to get an idea of just how much the re these residents knew uh, going in. So, um, both girls had a pretty big role when we were there. Um, Elaine, who was a little more, she's the one with the management consultant experience, um, she um, actually did the, the presentations. Uh, she started, here's her, one of her slides from her talk. She started just talking about us, and then she progressed to talk about the collaboration, um, you know, with her language skills, obviously. It was much more efficient for her to do the, the presentation. Mong Fei had the slightly more intimidating task of translating for Dr. Du. Now, Dr. Du was the, um, she was the chairman of radiology at People's Hospital. We were all terrified of her. And um, these were really more negotiations. She, she wanted, uh, in order to participate and share her resources, there were certain things that she wanted from, from us, from Duke. Um, so there were, there were basically negotiation sessions. And Dr. Du uh, expected Mong Fei to translate for her. And not like translate like a phrase or a sentence at a time, but Dr. Du would talk for like five minutes and then look at Mong Fei and say, translate. And poor Mong Fei in front of a room full of about 30 people um, with varying amounts of English and Spanish, uh, of Chinese, would then have to, uh, to translate to make sure she understood all the nuances of the negotiation process. And poor Mong Fei went home kind of physically ill every night, but did an amazing job and tells, tells me after it's, uh, it was one of her great, great experiences of the trip. In fact, it was, it's kind of been a joke since every time there's something that Elaine or I didn't understand, we'd look at Mong Fei and say, Translate. So she would explain it for us. So um, what the two students gained from this experience? Um, for tangibles, they both got uh, multiple trips to China. Um, they both got a, got a publication, and Elaine, a first author publication, and they both got the best letters of recommendation that I can write. Um, there are intangibles, too, and I asked them in a recent email to kind of list some of them for me, um, and this is how they responded. Uh, being able to talk with students and residents that around our age was a great experience. Um, they used the opportunity to practice medical Chinese. Uh, it forced me to reach outside my comfort zone with a lot of public speaking and on the spot improvising. I think this is Mong Fei referring to her translation experience. Um, surprised at how much fun I had and how much I challenged myself. Um, identifying opportunities for future growth and collaboration, be it in resident education or research. Um, special opportunity, uh, made great friends, and, and uh, they both thought it was a highlight of, it's been a highlight of their medical school years. I also asked them whether, um, based on this experience, um, it led to them any, any consideration of radiology as a career choice. They both were kind of political and nice and said yes, but I think they were just being polite. I don't, I don't think that was probably the case. Um, one has gone into med internal medicine and the other ophthalmology, um, but they threw me this bone. I also asked whether it had any, it, it might lead to consideration of, of career or more involvement in global, in global health. And to this, they both more sincerely said yes. Um, but truthfully, they both came into this experience with interest as well. And, uh, and one has actually already started on uh, other global health um, uh, ideas in, in, in her, in her uh, new subspecialty. What I gained, so um, basically I gained a project, like I said up front, I would not have been able to do this without them. So obviously their, the language and communication skills were absolutely necessary. They gave me legitimacy uh, being there, so I was trusted to some extent. Um, again, uh, Elaine's project management skills, I didn't realize up front quite how important they'd be. Um, creativity, resourcefulness, um, and friends. Um, I just, I really enjoyed the two of them throughout their uh, med school years. Here they are at my house at Thanksgiving, uh, the year before last. Um, Elaine and Mong Fei here with my two boys. Um, and seeing the Duke shirt realizes I, I have uh, been speaking for about 15 minutes and haven't mentioned our recent national championship. 
I guess I just did. <laughs> so in summary then, um, just remember the medical students. Um, our medical students are amazingly talented and they have skills that they can bring to any project, but certainly a global health project because global health projects often present unique challenges that maybe your residents uh, can't fill. Um, and to be honest, being a program director, my loyalty is probably to the residents, and in most cases that would be my first choice, but clearly there are projects where the, um, this, uh, the medical students will have the best skill set. And certainly we'd all agree global health projects are a great experience for medical students as they are for our residents. Thank you. Um, thank you very much to all of our speakers. I'm now going to open up the floor to any questions. This is such a large room, I'm going to really ask people to use the microphone in the center of a room if you have any questions. Um, so, I, If not, I have a question for Kate. A lot of programs now are having independent interventional radiology interest groups. And Do you have one at your place? Or is, is it competition with your group? Um, Currently, we do not, and I've just been speaking with our coordinator um, this week about that, and we're meeting next week because we decided that I will still do the first couple, and then those that are interested in interventional will start to branch. I think it's an important idea that you're not in competition with the same group of students, and I think it, each, or, each uh, institution is going to have to address this issue. Good. Maria, please. Uh, you know, regarding a separate uh, interest group for interventional radiology at our institution, we embrace it. We think it's great because these students, although the membership overlaps a little bit, um, there's, uh, we saw it as a springboard where particularly residents who are interested in interventional radiology actually took the ownership and leadership of starting that interest group and recruiting the students. Um, in terms of what they cover and activities, they're different. They're doing more hands-on workshops with interventional and different activities. And last but not least, the uh, medical school provides fundings for this group. So instead of just getting one funding for one radiology group, I get twice the amount of money, which is good to subsidize both groups. Thank you. Matt? Another uh, comment or question for Kate about the radiology interest group. Uh, we just started one that was a big success. We had uh, four students going to radiology. But to form the group, um, the institution said, it's great, but you need to do a philanthropy event. And I was wondering if you guys do any philanthropy events. We did the, the Race for the Cure, which was a lot of fun, and uh, ra raised some money for, for it, and it was a big success. No, but you have given me a great idea. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? I wanted to address this to Alex and, and to others, too. One of the things that I think um, a role we can play in adding quality to medical education is stepping out of our role as a radiologist and as moving into the role of the physician teacher. And I've really tried to encourage our younger members of our faculty to teach in the fundamentals of patient care program, you know, the physical diagnosis, learning to interview patients, in our ethics courses, and um, we're getting, I, I, it's a great experience for them, and it's a great experience for our st students, and they see us in a totally different light, not as technicians in a dark room, yep. but as physicians. So, and, and in addition, we get paid well for that. That, uh, you know, strategically trying to get funding for our education, um, I think that's a valuable way to go. At least in our institution, that's how it works. Absolutely, that's a great comment. And if, you know, if there's one unifying theme uh, to what those those different categories uh, of roles that I was able to talk about, um, you know, we we voiced here that we wish, as a specialty and as a a group of caring physicians, to be considered by students as such. And I think, though not directly tied to what they're ultimately going to go into in terms of their career, those that continue to believe that we're in in the dark and don't have patient interaction, the first step to sort of convincing them and illustrating to them otherwise is may not be through words and documents as much as our deeds and our presence in classes, just like what you've described. That's an excellent point. Okay, Judy? Hi, Judy from, uh, does this work? Can you hear me? From Rutgers University. Um, I enjoy this very much to really hear these ex uh, amazing experiences that you all presented. And 
I think uh, one of you alluded to it. Um, do you find that medical students are really overall such an exciting group to work with? And uh, I think that uh, Rathan pointed out the enthusiasm, all the, it, it's absolutely fantastic. Now I've been clerkship director as well as program director and the residents are totally different. There's something that in the process from medical school to residency <laughs> happens and that there's something wrong with that because why is it that the that enthusiasm is gone during the residency? I wonder if you could address internship. <laughs> I have observed this again and again and again throughout multiple places I have uh, multiple countries I worked with, worked at. Um, I think it's partly when they come as med students, they are green, they are um, dreaming, they, are, um, they don't have any sort of baggage. Um, their goal is uh, achievement um, and we are part of that exciting journey. I really think it is truly meaningful part of that exciting journey. By the time they entered uh, residency and fellowship, um, you only see few of them has that spark. Um, the, the spark that we see it in almost every med student or, or undergrad, we see only <laughs> on, in few of them. I think they have, they, you know, it, it's a satisfaction. Yep, I achieved my goal of entering radiology residency or I achieved my goal of entering medical school, that sort of dissipates the, all the dreaming and energy and enthusiasm and livelihood they come up with. That's what my gut feeling is, but I'm, I, I don't know. But I have seen this again and again. Question for Catherine. We've heard at various presentations that people get really creative about phantoms and different things that they use for hands-on experience. What do you use for your para workshop, was it, or the thorough workshop for your IR? Oh, the paracentesis? Yeah. Um, so we do a how to do a ultrasound guided paracentesis wet lab elective, and we use the simulation center and the blue phantom, um, a blue phantom phantom um, of a torso that has actual fluid in it, and the ultrasound or they. Um, and now that workshop is it's it's six hours. The first two hours we're talking about ascites. So again, I'm teaching them something that they haven't heard about before. Um, and then we teach ultrasound principles, and then we do a demonstration of the procedure. And then the next day, we divide it up into three workshops because we only have two phantoms, and they rotate every 45 minutes. And we also do consenting, so they have to um, they learn how to consent, and then they have to consent me, and then they move on to keep practicing. And then the last day, um, we we set it up that we set up an appointment between the two medical students to come for a 20 minutes or 30 minute slot and then we don't say anything and they have to um, consent to each other in front of me and then um, I do an informal assessment with a checklist because there's no grading, it's an elective, but um, the, co the comments I've received have been outstanding and it's been a lot of fun. I'd be curious to know from people from the audience as far as creativity with phantoms because chicken gets really messy and kind of <laughs> dirty very quickly, so I'd be curious to know if anybody has any other thoughts. Well, I also, do, I also have used a, um, a full, small chicken, and if you leave it wrapped in the plastic and still on the styrofoam tray, um, you can practice, and then I, fill, I only open it up at the end, and I fill the cavity with thick fluid. Um, and to, What's thick? Do you use gel? I actually use gel with yeah. a little bit of water. I mix that up and then I shove it into that one slot. That's the only area that's opened. And then um, because I, I can't di use dilators or um, the, the bigger catheter size on the blue phantoms, but I can do it on these small full chickens. And then they actually get a real great tactile feel as well because the plastic's almost like a little bit of the skin and then they got to go through some of the, the cartilage. But yeah, a small chicken, leave the plastic on so it's not slimy and gross and um, you leave it on the tray for stability. It, it, it's really great. I have a recipe for, it's, um, it, it's a type of gel mold and we have 
put polyfill and stuff in, so it gives textures. We use it for making breast phantoms. They're very easy to make. You can kind of cook a whole bunch up in your kitchen, no time flat, and they last in the fridge for several days. I can share in one, and we've used them for ultrasound-guided procedures for you know just needling skills. We put some little olives in them, so they've got some things to biopsy and get the pimentos. Yeah, I mean, you could put anything in it. What we found was adding, I mean, it's basically um, uh, gelatin, but then we um, make sure it's opaque, and then the stuff, the fiber fill that comes in pillows gives it stability and texture and stops it wobbling around, and it's actually not bad. And ultrasound, it, it scans very well. Can I just make one very quick comment, because I don't need to jump in front of Kim up here, Petra Lewis and Diamond. Uh, the whole thing about medical students and where... You know, where does that beautiful excitement disappear when they arrive on your doorstep a year later? I kind of think of it like your teenagers. You know, suddenly when they go from grade school to middle school, that you suddenly at one day turn around and go, who are you? Who left you here last night? Because, you know, my beautiful child who was so enthusiastic is now this deeply cynical, yeah, whatever, mom, type of person. But then they come back. And I think residents sort of do the same. You know, there's a... They, somewhere in residency that some, not all of them, lose that excitement, but they're still, they come back, you know, they become 18-year-olds and suddenly, 19-year-olds, suddenly mum is cool again and the excitement is there. Um, so don't think of it as they're gone, they're just sort of temporarily absent. <laughs> Kimmy? Uh I'm Kimmy Kondo from University of Colorado. I just wanted to make a couple comments. Um, one, um, I'm an interventional radiologist, and I know that there's been a big push to have a separate IR interest group. And I think it's going to depend on your, your situation. In some situations, maybe it's about the finances. Um, you know, at our institution, we kind of combine it because, again, there's such a small number of students that I really don't want to split that and and in terms of resources I think it's important um, for even from faculty mentoring and everything that that we're together as a group um, one of the things in terms of finances though that that we were able to do is that a lot of your institutions have foundations we have a CU foundation and um, don't forget about that because I think faculty Will, or uh, alumni would be very interested in donating to um, medical student education or RIGs, and so set up a fund under your um, your foundation, and then it could be a tax deduction. And so uh, that's what we have at our institution. Any other questions? Yes. Hi. I had uh, one comment and a question. I'm Smyrna from Loma Linda, and one of the things that Loma Linda, um, we, we pride ourselves in his missionary work. And one of the things that when I decided to go into radiology coming from Loma Linda is how would radiology be involved in the missionary work um, globally? And um, for our institution, we're actually starting a missionary elective with our radiology residents and hope to incorporate uh, medical students with that. But um, that was just a comment. But another question I had was actually for uh, mock interviews. Um, how are you able to get the uh, information about the medical student? You mentioned that medical students gave you their information. Um, I do mock interviews, and the only things that I'm able to really get, because I'm not part of the admission committee, is their CV and their personal statement, and especially now with the new AMC letters not going through the dean's office. How are you able to get all that information prior to the mock interview? So I do work um, really close with the um, admissions committee coordinator as well, and I have all the medical students um, send me actual written permission that I can look at their ERASP application. I use that. Perry? Hi, I'm Perry Pernicano from University of Michigan. My question or comment is for Dr. Maxfield. So despite not having standardization and certification and everything, one of your first comments was that you encountered talented and brilliant Chinese radiologists when you went there. Um, so, you know, how did they get there? And again, you, you talked about the cultural things. Did they feel like you were superimposing um, Western culture of certification and MOC and all these administrative kind of things that, that we do or we hold, you know, sacred on their Eastern kind of culture of like, 
well, we haven't been doing this, and yet we have brilliant and talented radiologists. <laughs> I didn't mention the MOC part. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, um, it, it depended a lot on who I talked to, especially in Beijing when we, we met with radiologists from the smaller hospitals. Some of them were tearful, so excited to get, to get help and someone who was interested and potentially get more resources to, to teach. Um, those from, um, that were more established were, were not quite as interested and, you know, maybe interested that I thought I could maybe <laughs> um, do something like this, but, um, but not as, in, as interested in helping. My own experience has been some of these, uh, in my experience with China, is many of those have done years in the United States, the people who are often at the top of their uh, universities, um, are very special scholars who were sent here in nuclear medicine and other things, particularly in the 80s and 90s. Um, so, yeah, and at this meeting, I, I assumed I was meeting a, a, a select pool. Too. Yeah, you are. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Question, please. Yeah. Mark Delano from Michigan State. Oh, and cr congratulations to both uh, Chuck and to Alex for their respective national championships. <laughs> uh, maybe next year. Uh, we uh, we had a visiting fellow come over from China, from Beijing, Sanjin Hospital, uh, for uh, about a year and a half, and it was a experience for him to, to learn English, I think. Uh, that was part of it. But the other part was a lot of industry that came out of it. And it started a reciprocal uh, visitation that I went back for uh, as a neuroradiologist for their cardiac conference, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but uh, we uh, had to establish some trust issues initially. The first thing they had me do is sit down and uh, show them how I scan hearts which was interesting. The, the concept of the radiologists doing the own, their own, own MR scanning uh, was uh, a little bit uh, uh, different than anything we had. Uh, the, the concept of brilliant is uh, one that we used a wide berth with. Uh, I think we had quite a, a range of, of, of skill sets, but the, the concept of appreciation and passion that they had for, for any input at all, and I brought cases to show them, and with disclosure, I, I was capable of scanning the heart, uh, only because of a, a passion for MR that allowed me to muddle through. But uh, they did give me some tips on that. But the, uh, the reciprocity concepts are, are pretty enormous, and uh, we hope to continue that relationship. And, and I guess point out, I can respond to the last two comments, is you know, maybe my, my use of the word brilliant was to, more to point out just a contrast between how, you know, very capable the radiologists were, and then my perception that their training was very insufficient and needed, you know, needed addressing. Any other questions? If not, we're going to conclude this session. I want to thank the speakers and the organizer. And I want to remind people that there is an AMSER ACER reception uh, later this afternoon. Uh, the exact time is in your, your program, and you're more, all more than welcome to attend that. And I do want to remind people of that today. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much.